Thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. At the beginning of the pandemic, there was a lot of excitement around the use of artificial intelligence to help us fight COVID. But now that we're 18 months into it, did AI actually help? The answer, it turns out, is not really. But digging into the reason why AI didn't turn out to be all that useful reveals some interesting patterns that we might want to pay attention to, especially since this is unlikely to be the last global challenge that we face. So why didn't AI help? A lot of it comes down to data set issues. And if you're interested in reading more in detail about this topic, there are two review papers that I highly recommend checking out. One of them is a literature review on all of the literature as it relates to machine learning and COVID-19. And the other one is specific to medical imaging. Both of these papers highlight that researchers were essentially working with limited data the entire time. Much of the data that we had was from the United States and Western Europe, which isn't necessarily representative of the entire global global population, and a lot of the data sets even within that were still limited based on what people happened to be uploading at the time. And as we know, machine learning has flourished under big data, and so without enough data to reasonably train models, you pretty quickly run into some problems. And this isn't to say that people weren't trying to create larger data sets. In fact, people were often uploading clinical data to public data sets so that researchers could try to develop models that would be helpful here. However, because people were uploading data to public data sets, we don't know how much of that data is duplicate data, and we also don't know how much of that data really represents the entire distribution of possible COVID cases that a clinician or an AI algorithm attempting to diagnose someone might see. In particular, a lot of the data that was uploaded to public data sets was uploaded or shared because it was interesting, and in that case, it usually means that the data was either particularly severe or particularly unusual, which at the end of the day, while interesting from a medical or basic science perspective, are actually outside of the normal distribution of cases that a clinician would see and are outside of the range of the types of cases that a machine learning algorithm would be expected to perform well on. In particular, when it comes to severe or unusual cases, it's not useful to have an algorithm that can only predict whether or not you have COVID once it's fairly obvious from other symptoms that you have it. This was also an issue when it came to using fitness trackers as COVID predictors. A lot of the studies that looked at things like the Apple Watch, that looked at things like the Whoop Strap, as well as the Aura Ring, found that most of the time, by the time an algorithm could reliably predict whether or not someone had COVID, there was symptomatic evidence that they had it and you didn't really need the ring or the fitness tracker to be able to tell that. Another issue with people around the world uploading data to public data sets was that we often had images compressed based on whatever protocol you were uploading the data under, and people were uploading a bunch of different file formats. So for medical imaging, we often use DICOM files, but a lot of these data sets were not being uploaded as DICOM, they were being uploaded as standard JPEGs or PNG files, and as we actually talked about in the video on whether or not AI can predict whether you are a criminal, how you compress and encode images introduces additional features to your model that may result in predictions that are more dependent on features that don't actually have anything to do with the thing you're interested in testing. In this case, having images coming from different sources in different file formats means that there may be aspects of the prediction system that you're creating that are actually predicting more based on things unrelated to whether or not someone has COVID-19 and more based on how the person who uploaded the file happened to upload it. Along that line, both studies also pointed out that there was a lot of mismatched testing in the work on using machine learning for COVID-19. And when I say mismatched testing, what I mean is that the control data set, so the data set that we're using as a baseline, was not actually comparable to the data set containing COVID-19 cases. For example, one of the common data sets used as a control was actually a set of medical images from pediatric cases, whereas the model was being trained to predict on adults. And so whether or not the model is performing well may have more to do with whether or not the model is detecting the difference between adults and children than the difference between COVID patients and non-COVID patients. Lastly, for people who weren't interested in predicting things like whether or not someone had COVID and who were more interested in predicting things like someone's mortality risk if they already had COVID, we just didn't have a lot of data to work with. 
These studies are typically called longitudinal studies because they look at the progression of disease or the evolution of someone's health over a long period of time. And because COVID was a new disease, we just didn't have that data. So it's hard to create a model that would predict how someone might fare when they have COVID-19 when we just didn't have enough data to know that yet. Interestingly, one of the other things that comes up in both of these review papers are the issues of reproducibility and interpretability. In the former case, reproducibility looks at situations where we can take results that someone has shown in a paper and reproduce them ourselves. And this can be hard to do if people don't A, release their code, or B, if people use private data sets that they also don't release. There were a few cases in COVID-19 studies for machine learning where people were using private data sets, so it's hard to make any generalizable conclusions about those studies without knowing what the demographic distribution of the data set behind it looks like. When it comes to interpretability, and especially when it comes to translating things from academia to the clinic, clinicians generally need to know why a model has made a particular prediction. What about the patient's demographic factors? What about the history of their illness to date makes the model think that they are going to have a particular outcome or that they're more or less likely to be diagnosed with COVID-19. And this is a problem that has definitely challenged the machine learning community for a while now. If you're interested in learning more about that, I have a video about explainable and interpretable machine learning models, which you can check out up here. But when it comes down to a essentially translating things to the clinic, you actually need that in order to get a lot of models FDA approved. And we definitely wouldn't be able to do that with the information that we currently have about the models that have been published so far. Lastly, both of these papers looked at essentially a risk of bias in these models. So there are established academic and clinical standards for whether or not a machine learning model is more or less likely to have a risk of bias. And most of the models in both of these studies showed either a high risk of bias or an unclear risk of bias, both of which essentially say that it's unlikely that we'd be able to take these models and generalize them to larger populations. And again, this is not a new problem. If we look at things like IBM Watson Health, we found that clinicians could train a model in one geographic region and then try to take that model and apply it to a different one. And it didn't work anymore because the distribution of disease outcomes and disease incidences in those different regions were different and based on different factors, including things like environmental factors and demographic factors. And because of that, the risk of bias in most of these models would disqualify the vast majority of them for use in the clinic. So as you can see, there are a few through lines in terms of the things that made it so that AI wasn't super useful when it came to the pandemic. One of them is data. So access to data, how we take data from the clinic to academia or to research and how we organize it and format it in a way that is useful going forward. And then two, collaboration between people making these models and the actual clinicians. In a lot of cases, the people developing the models weren't actually talking to clinicians, and there was a bit of a disconnect between those two groups because the needs of the clinicians were different from the use cases that the analysts were coming up with. When it comes to doing better in the future, one of the big things that could help us is building a better pipeline for labeling, organizing, formatting, and sharing health-related data sets. One of the limitations here, at least in the US, is HIPAA, which is a government regulation that essentially protects the privacy of individuals when it comes to their health data and limits how we can share and store health data for people. And I think that while that's certainly important, there's definitely progress that could be made and also loopholes in current HIPAA regulations that don't take into account the advances that we've had in current technologies. The other thing that would be really useful is just having more collaboration between clinicians and engineers. And I'm in a PhD program for medical engineering and medical physics that is essentially based on this idea that we want to train engineers who think more like clinicians and clinicians who think more like engineers. And I think that one of the really big things that comes out of that is having those interdisciplinary collaborations that allow researchers to know exactly what the clinic really needs and use that to inform the work that they're doing in their research. For example, one of the things that came up in both of these papers was the issue of researchers often rescaling medical images to fit the models that they were interested in training them on based on the models themselves and not based on the features that were clinically relevant in the images themselves. So in compressing the data, they might actually be losing information that is clinically valuable, but they're doing so because they need to fit them into a pre-trained model. 
In short, we need better systems for data sharing and more interdisciplinary scientific thinking. Both, I think, are entirely possible if we put in the work, especially before the next global challenge. In fact, if you're looking to improve your scientific thinking skills, Brilliant just updated their scientific thinking course with some really cool interactive features that lets you experience the principles of science firsthand. If you've heard me talk about Brilliant before, then you know that it's a website and app built on the principle of active problem solving. After all, to really learn something, it's not enough to just watch someone else do it, you have to actually do it yourself. For example, if you'd like to be prepared to apply algorithms to the next global challenge, but have been put off by opaque coding languages, Brilliant can help you learn how to program without having to dig through the weeds of coding syntax through these fun interactive challenges. You just shift around these blocks of pseudocode and then you can get immediate feedback on your results. It's a good way to understand how computer algorithms work and then once you have that down, the coding syntax becomes a lot less imitating. On Brilliant, it's not about memorizing or regurgitating facts for a test. You can just pick a course you're interested in and get started. Feeling stuck or made a mistake, you can read the explanations to find out more and learn at your own pace. So if you'd like to try Brilliant for free and get 20% off a year of STEM learning, you can click the link in the description down below or sign up at brilliant.org Jordan to get started.